OK, perfect. So thank you everyone for joining um, today's webinar. Tonight, today our subject is lower, lower with solar sustainable DLE operations with solar thermal. So as countries push forward towards net zero emissions and cleaner energy sources, lithium ion battery technology is championed as the key to global decarbonization, enabling massive market growth and non-carbon emitting electric vehicles. Lithium mining and refining are energy intensive. As ally production increases, so does CO2 emissions, unless better and cleaner methods of production are employed. Today, um, for this topic, I would like to introduce both Grant Thornley, who is our Vice President of Sales Solutions, as well as Guido Hamacher, who um, is a representative for Alborg CSP for North America and has been involved in concentrated solar power projects for over 13 years. He currently leads business development efforts in district energy and seasonal energy storage in Canada and the US. Guido holds a bachelor's degree in manufacturing technology from the Technical University Dusseldorf and a bachelor's degree in computer science for mechanical engineers from the Technical University of Wiesbaden. So welcome everyone. Um, I just want to give some quick housekeeping rules. Well, rules. Um, it, so as usual, this will be recorded and this will then be put on our website as well as LinkedIn for those who would like to refer back to it. Um, that should be up in the next couple days. And at the end, we will be holding a Q&A portion. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave them there or in the chat. Uh, as always, we would like to start with a quick poll. So I will just launch that. The poll today is what is your level of interest in solar thermal energy? Are you very interested? interested or somewhat interested. I'll give everyone a couple minutes or a minute to answer that. Thank you very much. So now I will um, give both Grant and Guido the floor. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate uh, everyone uh, attending this webinar. Uh, let me I'll start up my, my screen here and share my screen. That. Perfect. So I thought it'd be um, very um, a good opportunity in which to take a look at uh, energy. I mean, we, we discuss a lot about um, uh, direct lithium extraction or DLE, the acronym, uh, and one of the, the the drivers for that is. Uh, Water conservation, because a lot of these areas are uh, water stressed or or completely drought, uh, as well as looking towards reducing CO2 emissions uh, regarding um, uh, initiatives on uh, net zero re reduction. Um, so in that uh, today's topic is is to take a look at um, direct lithium extraction, specifically on on uh, concentration of the brines or eluates. Uh, regarding the extraction of water, uh, reuse, and in turn, well, how can we do this uh, at lower lower costs and uh, lower CO2? So with that, uh, I won't belabor it. It's that uh, lithium demand. Uh, it's uh, it's rising on a regular basis. Uh, probably about 75% uh, of the lithium. Uh, I'm going to say even, um, I'm sorry, even higher than that, probably around 90% now of the lithium that is being uh, produced uh, is going towards the production of uh, lithium ion batteries. So just quickly overview is that um, even though you have a battery, they're, they're very small, they, they don't have a lot of lithium in them, but because you have uh, cars that have 7,000, 10,000 lithium ion batteries in it, they, they add up. And the projection of is that by 2030, 70% of the global population will have an electric vehicle. So that's a lot of batteries. That's a lot of lithium to mine. Um, quite quickly on the lithium production projections, uh, right now we're probably about 100,000 metric tons, um, maybe 200,000 uh, right now. But the point is that supply uh, or the supply right now outstrips demand or, or sorry the demand outstrips supply and by 2030 you're looking at about 2.63 million metric tons uh, that we have to be producing in order to meet the the, the demand so that's why we see a lot of um, uh, companies 
jumping in and onto the lithium bandwagon and starting up their, their mines and productions. Uh, a lot of them are associated with lithium brines versus uh, hard rock or open pit mines. Reason being is that it's much easier, well, relatively speaking, it's much easier to, uh, to develop um, and um, basically commercialize a, a brine operation than a open pit. VAV, the environmental permanent alone, would probably take you about 10 years in order to, to, to start up a, 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 um, a hard rock spudgymine mine uh, versus uh, brine, which may take about a, a year, two years to get your environmental permits. Uh, right now, a lot, the majority of the lithium being produced is out of Australia uh, and South America. Um, there's some in China. Really, China is more of a, a converter, but those are the three main areas uh, where our lithium supply comes from. So getting into, into the market drivers of, um, of, of DLE, of what really, under the lens of, of lithium production using direct lithium extraction, um, really the, the market's expectation is that the production of lithium is going to be green, meaning that it's going to have, you know, uh, a very good water footprint, water reuse, you know, the target 100%. I don't know if you can do that, but that's the target. CO2 emission reductions, uh, which is associated to your carbon footprint, it, that's got to be very low. And the environmental impact uh, to it has to be very low, meaning that the any chemistries or waste, it's not going to harm the environment. So interesting that, that the lens that lithium is being viewed uh, fair or unfair compared to other industries such as oil and gas. This is what the market is looking for. And this is what the lithium um, uh, producers and um, uh, mine owners are, are um, moving towards. As we see, and what, what, what are we seeing within the, in the, the industry? Why do we see this as market drivers? Well, you're seeing the from Kyoto Accord to Paris Agreement, where you had, you know, 120, even more than 120 countries sign on to the Paris Agreement, which is uh, a consensus on on CO2 reduction emissions. Um, so, in a lot of companies, you'll see is that, you know, it's a net zero by 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 2050. So, everyone is moving towards uh, the CO2 emission reduction. Well, why is that? It's because of the environmental impact of it. Uh, the, the numbers out there, I think, for you know, one, one degree um, uh, as, as the carbon goes up, a one degree uh, increase can have detri detrimental and CO2 uh, will, will cause that. If we don't drop the, the, the CO2 down, then it will have um, extraordinary um, environmental impacts to it. The other component is that, um, <laughs> as government loves, is that, well, if you're going to produce CO2, no problem, we'll, we'll, we'll just tax you on the carbon. So um, there's a, a development of a cap and trade. This, this is sort of like the pain point that if you, um, it's, an, it's a nice thing to reduce your CO2, but if you don't, there's a pain point to it, meaning that every year the government is going to reduce the permitting uh, or the allowable emissions for CO2 on companies. So it's going to get harder and harder and harder to 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 produce a product without violating CO2 emissions. So everyone is now um, I shouldn't say everyone is now looking at technologies in order to reduce CO2. Um, if you don't reduce the CO2, then the cap and trade is that well, if I'm a company and I reduce my CO2 emissions, so let's say I have 100 units, I put in technologies, I'm only at 50 units, I can sell those other 50 units up. Uh, to another company to allow them to to emit more so this the cap and trade or carbon market is now ha has developed because of that um, and there's an opportunity that if i do reduce my co2 i can make some money so here's an example uh the carbon so uh, 75 dollars per metric ton um that's in the in the uk in different countries it's not a harmonized market but you know let's say if you're in the uk uh for every ton i can i can make or get a credit for $75. So there's incentives to do this. The other incentive for environmental, social, and governments is the financial community has adopted uh, ESG. What does that mean? Is that the the investments or the or this the the strength and confidence in the company will be measured by the ESG rating. If you have a high rating, that's great. If you have a low rating, you're going to find it challenging to 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 get investors or um, uh, or buyers in, into your stock. So there is a financial penalty 
um, by having a low ESNG, and we are focused on the environmental aspect of it. So if you can get a better water footprint, reduce your CO2, uh, less environmental impact, your ESNG rating goes up, which means you have a stronger financial um, um, strength within the market space. So uh, always look at what are the pain points in market in order to drive these forward. And CO2 reduction, it's not just a nicety. There is pain by, by not doing it. Next is water uh, scarcity. So uh, I, I didn't throw the, I think you've seen enough of these maps around the world where you see that there's a, by 2030, there's, I'm going to say there's no water. Um, but it, it, is, it is a scary demographic and, and projection uh, that we're seeing that as, as temperatures rise, the more water evaporates and there's more drought areas. Um, so water scarcity uh, means, of course, you know, if there's less water, there's going to be more costs associated to that. So operating costs are going to go up. So that drives um, the other component is recycling, that the cost of water goes up, but then there's the availability of water that um, you don't have to look any further than California where there's water restrictions. So if you're a company and the, the city calls up and goes, by the way, um, at two o'clock, you have to shut your water off and shut production down. That's not very good for, for uh, uh, production profitability, uh, and they run the risk. So the drive to recycle water, to be in more control of your operations and not have these restrictions or unscheduled outages is critical. The other component is the aquifers. As you continue to pump down aquifers, the water quality gets less and less and less. Um, and if you don't have the proper treatment, that may affect uh, product. The other component is the hydrology of it, that as you pack, uh, sorry, um, pump down uh, an aquifer, then what you see, and we have seen this, is that you get seawater ingression. So now your fresh water is mixing with salt water. So there is a real uh, need and cost associated with uh, recycling water. Uh, the last one, just to emphasize that how important water is and the, the paradigm shift in industry where they are now looking at water as it's on its real value and as a real asset to the point, I just kind of threw this up here, water is now being traded as an asset. This is water is being traded on the stock exchange under futures. So that doesn't mean if, that's like trading air, uh, relatively speaking. So water is now, because the projected value and the demand for water is so high, it's trading on the stock exchange. So, so that should be a little bit of a of, of wake up call that we have to get on top of uh, water recycling. So taking a look at what's important in, in a direct lithium extraction process, we talked about the CO2 and water. The intent of a DLE is essentially is I, I'm gonna be taking a brine, uh, I wanna reduce the volume, uh, I wanna, from the volumes I extract from the water, I want to be able to have clean enough water to reuse back into my process. And I want to be able to, to concentrate up that product as high as possible. So concentrate the lithium up. So essentially in DLE process, particularly on the post DLE, you're looking at reduction, reuse and recover, the three R's. How do you do that? When you take a look at this, there's a plethora of technologies out there. Um, conventionals and very mature technologies. And the intent is whenever you're looking at it is that how applicable is that technology and doesn't make economic sense. Technology moves and advances uh, at a very uh, pass, uh, fast rate. So as material sciences and chemistries progress, new technologies uh, emerge. So what we're looking at is conventional technologies is typically in a DLE sheet is reverse osmosis and then you jump to a thermal evaporator, maybe maybe a crystallizer. Uh, what we have developed is a technology for osmosis, which kind of bridges the cap um, between the reverse osmosis and evaporators, but to the point that we've advanced it so much, it can now replace an evaporator. So when you're looking at your process flow sheet, there are different technologies to, to examine out uh, there. And of course, it's always the economic side to it. The, the main delivery is, is the concentration of the product and the recovery of water and reduction of CO2. So that's how you should, should qualify and weight those technologies. And we've been able to, to produce that. Just quickly get everyone on the same page. What is forward osmosis? It's very different from um, uh, reverse osmosis um, in that there's no pressure. 
common to it, it is a semi-permeable, oh, sorry, semi-permeable membrane, which water can pass uh, uh, to and from. The difference is, is that with Ford osmosis, we, we put a salt on one side. So here's pure water, we put a salt on one side, and what happens, as soon as we introduce salt or a solute, the what happens is the solute begins to attract water. Think of it as magnets. It starts pulling water across that membrane, and it happens without external energy, and it happens spontaneously. And as you can see here is that the water, as soon as I add that, the water starts migrating across. This you know, has been happening for millions of years. This is how tree, uh, the plants operate, how the cells in your body operate. It is a well understood um, uh, um, uh, science. The challenge is, is that how do you take something in nature and scale it up to a commercial economics uh, uh, with good economics to it? And uh, that's what we focused on the past 10 years and our patents are associated to that. Because the intent is this is sort of like free energy. I drop that in, the water comes across, moves free energy, spontaneous. The challenge is I don't want salt water on pure water. So think of this as the front end is the free lunch, the back end, well, that's what costs you. That's where the, the energy and the processing comes in. The key is how do I minimize the energy in which to separate the salt from, from the water? And that's the key. Just quickly, pressure. Um, is uh, RO is pressure driven, uh, FO is not pressure driven, meaning that as the um, as the salt uh, content goes up, I have to apply more pressure to push that water across. So you can see that uh, on TDS sides, as the TDS goes up, there's 500. If I get to salt water around 45,000, it's around 1,100 psi. Challenge with RO is that there is a limit on the pressures of the materials that you can go. So this can only go so high and it stops. FO is not pressure driven and allows it to give you an understanding is that for an RO to be equivalent to an FO, you'd have to have a pumping pressure of around 3,200 PSI. Doesn't exist. This is not pressure driven, but this is would be equivalent to an RO. So as soon as I drop in that solute, it starts pulling that water across. This allows us to operate at very, very high TDSs. And just as a comparison is that RO, if I can say relatively speaking, operates in low TDS environments. FO loves operating in high TDS environments. So these two technologies are actually complementary and, and synergistic to each other. So quick difference in the operations on a pressure driven, I won't belabor this, is that, but if I have uh, uh, solids or contaminants in my bulk water and I'm, I have hydraulics and pushing it towards a membrane, the tendency of fouling and, and compacting the uh, uh, solids onto the membrane is quite high. This, this leads to irreverse uh, flux loss. With FO, remember, we're just drawing water across. It doesn't mean we're not going to foul the membranes, but it means that when we do foul, it, it's a very loose matrix and it's very easy to clean. So much so is that if I just kind of push water across this at a high velocity and scour it, that'll clean the membrane off and recover my flux without the use of chemicals. And remember, on the environmental side is that we want to minimize the, the amount of chemical use we, we have on site. So getting into conventional versus FO on the energy side, Conventional is a thermal evaporator or bulk boiler where I take the entire fluid in and I hit it with high pressure, high temperature, and I distill like a kettle, distill water off. It's very energy intensive. It's a large footprint. And because of the complexities and the aggressiveness uh, of the, 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 the brines as you concentrate it up, these are built with very unique uh, or exotic metals such as uh, hasteloid, titanium, uh, and very expensive. So, with FO, um, since it isn't a pressure driven or, or uh, a high temperature system, right away the energy requirements in contrast to a thermal evaporator is typically half of what you're going to see, and it's a lower footprint. And because it's not high temperature, high pressure, we don't have to use ex exotic metals uh, or, or allies to build this. Uh, a lot of it is just polymer or based um, 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 plastics uh, that we use. Uh, on the on the higher temperatures, a little bit, uh, we use um, stainless steel. When you contrast between the two, uh, thermal evaporator, because of the, whether it's oil and gas, uh, it's gonna burn a lot and produce a lot of CO2. Other challenges is that 
uh, when you take a look at some of these uh, greenfields or remote areas, maybe there is not a gas line there. Um, so the infrastructure in which to support this doesn't exist. So that's going to be a challenge. So the next is that to operate this off of electricity is going to be astronomical. Ford osmosis, if we, if we just compare it for natural gas, it's 50% of the carbon footprint. And what we're going to talk about today is that we have the ability to operate Ford osmosis using solar thermal. And as you can see, if we operate on solar thermal, which is alternative sustainable energy, the carbon footprint drops uh, significantly down and the energy cost drops down. Uh, there is a little bit of an energy component because we still need to have pumping the fluids uh, around. So what does an FO system look like? It's a three-step process. All these, here's the membranes. We have a, uh, here's our, bra our brine or, or eluate, a concentrated salt draw solution. Remember, we're gonna draw the water across. Concentrated salt draw comes into this, pulls the water across. That concentrated solution becomes a diluted solution, moves over here. Here's kind of where the secret sauce is, is that when we, that draw solution, when we hit it with a low grade heat, 60, 90 degrees, that it causes the salt to transition from a liquid to a gas. And when it transitions to a gas, it leaves solution, it leaves pure water behind, the water is ejected for reuse, and the gas is collected, cooled, concentrated, and returned back to the, to the system. So this is a closed loop process. Uh, nothing's left, left uh, leaves the system but pure water. So just looking at this a little bit more in depth is I won't belabor this, this but step two is that this salt, this is what we're doing. The reason the difference between us and the thermal evaporator is remember thermal evaporator, you're taking the entire fluid in and I'm heating the fluid up and I'm pressuring the entire fluid up. What we're doing is we're specifically targeting the salt component within the fluid and, and forcing like laser targeting is that we are then forcing through temperature to cause this to, to transition. So we're not heating up the entire, the intent isn't to heat up the, the, the bulk solution to still it. The intent is to cause this to transition to phase. And we do that using TMA and gas. Uh, so we, the, the salt, uh, patented salt is trimethyl ammonia bicarbonate, and that's within water. And then when we heat it up, it goes to TMA gas, CO2 gas, water is ejected, it's cooled, and reconcentrated back into its original form. This is an inorganic, not organic, so it doesn't degrade over time. Um, so as long as you, char you charge up the system, it's going to keep operating and won't degrade. Taking a look at the operations of the system. So when we collect the gas, we have to cool that. It doesn't require a lot. It's about 10 to 15 degrees C. And there are alternative energy sources that we can use depending on the geographic location. Uh, could be a cooling tower could be brine cooling, heat cooling, and this on a DLE operations, if the brine being pumped up from, uh, from the reserve is low enough, this becomes our heat sink and, and our cooling. So the energy required to cool, which typically isn't a lot, but it is then compensated. We can use this just on a simple heat exchanger that reduces our energy. Getting into the energy side, Again, flexible heat sources. We can use solar thermal, which we'll be talking about today, geothermal, waste heat, maybe a heat exchanger in the process, or like a landfill or, or, or available uh, methane gas or some type of gas. What we'll talk about is solar thermal, of using that to drive the, the process. And what that looks like is quite simple, is using a solar collector, heating up a fluid, comes through a heat exchanger, the heat exchanger then releases the energy to our process, which drives the, the regeneration and the extraction process. And by doing that, we can use alternative sustainable energy in which to, one is, I've had a different uh, scenarios here for, this is just a standard operating design, uh, whereas you know we're, we're extracting water around 80, 81% at around 28.8, kilowatts per cubic meter. But as you can see, when I add solar thermal, I get rid of this, it's now dropped down to 8.6 kilowatts per cubic meter. And if I was to add solar thermal and cooling from the brine, I'm now at 5.8 kilowatts per cubic meter. That is absolutely e extraordinary. So you can kind of see that with solar thermal, there is a great opportunity to, re to recover water 
reduce CO2, that's significant um, um, uh, operating reductions in operating costs using alternative sustainable energy. And with that, thank you, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Guido. Yeah, thank you uh, for having me in the webinar, Grant. I appreciate having the opportunity to all talk about Outbox CSP. So maybe you could get, can we go to the next slide then? Yes. To uh, yeah, introductory slide. So yeah, we will be talking. There we are. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Outbox CSP and the uh, background of our company, uh, which was started in the mid 80s as an engineering company that was involved with primarily uh, industrial boilers and uh, ship boilers. And then around 2006, seven, we um, got involved in um, concentrated solar power um, in uh, Spain to begin with. Maybe we can go to the next slide and really look at, at that. Um, so uh, we became uh, experts in tower systems for um, power towers, like you can see on the uh, third picture from the left where it says integrated energy system, you see a tower. Um, we also deal with parabolic trough. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this one, for instance, yeah, you can go to that slide. Um, <clears throat> this is an integrated power system in, uh, that we built in, um, in uh, Australia. So uh, the company now uh, is a specialist in concentrated solar power, and we also are working in district energy, which is uh, lower temperature systems that uh, integrate multiple technologies like uh, solar, concentrated solar, flat panel solar, heat pumps, and other technologies to um, meet the needs of whatever the energy requirements are. And um, that's uh, what we're hoping to bring uh, to this project. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we see a couple of uh, tower systems for which we uh, provided the receiver systems on top of the tower. Um, so the receivers, since they are being heated by the sun, they're also boilers. And uh, in this case here, we create high pressure steam that is used for electricity production. And on the next slide, we see um, several par parabolic trough systems in the, in the uh, bottom half of the picture uh, for which we um, design and deliver uh, steam generators that are particularly um, designed to work well under these conditions. And we are now on our fourth generation steam generator systems. On the right hand side of the slide, we can see a, a parabolic trough system and the parabolic trough, it's a, it's a mirror essentially um, bent in a parabola shape that reflects sunlight onto a receiver tube that runs to, through the focus of the parabola and the temperatures in the um, focal point are quite high. Uh, the receiver tube, uh, through the receiver tube is pumped typically a, um, a uh, oil, a thermal oil. Uh, that carries the uh, uh, the heat to the steam generators where we then make the steam to drive a turbine with. Next slide, please. A um, couple of um, <clears throat> reference from district energy projects we have built. These are applicable here because they are in about the temperature range uh, that is required for the forward osmosis process. And like Grant just explained, and um, we see here a variety of parabolic trough, flat panel systems. Um, there's a combination of system, there's heat pumps, and then also we have in the bottom left of the uh, picture, we have some uh, thermal storage ponds, which we also use for seasonal storage. That is a good way to, uh, to save up thermal energy that can be used then either later, a couple of months later, or uh, at whatever time you um, desire. So on the next slide, we can see uh, uh, here's a combination plant that we have built that is a combination of a flat panel system and a parabolic trough. So in the flat panel, we preheat, so to speak, um, the water that is then fed into the parabolic trough system to create higher temperatures. And uh, by focusing or defocusing, these parabolic troughs, we can modulate the heat output a little bit, and so that makes uh, good sense in the operation of the plant. Then in the next one, uh, next slide, please. 
Here's another parabolic trough plant that also um, is connected to a district energy system. And you can get an idea of uh, the flexibility of these plants. You can see the shape here is, uh, you know, they do not need to be rectangular necessarily. Uh, we have somewhat of a flexible layout in, in this particular case. Um, then on the and so you can see here is uh, oh yeah and so it's a 16.6 megawatt so that's a decent size output and it's an organic ranking cycle plan so uh, we also make uh, there's also electricity created along the way um and i will later show a slide um, there will be a slide from integrated system that uh, has multiple outputs um on the next slide if you can advance. Here we have a system. Uh, this is also a combination system where uh, flat panels are used. Uh, uh, different types are single glazed and dual glazed flat panel systems, with the uh, dual glazed um, offering a better insulation. So the heat um, that has been collected and is in the water inside these panels does not radiate to the environment. So it stays inside and uh, creates higher efficiency. And then this old water is uh, put into a storage tank in this case. Um, from, uh, you know, so that the storage tank can be, um, you know, to heat up during the day and then uh, at other times heat can be withdrawn. Plus here's a air source heat pump system included. So we have multiple options of uh, creating energy um, and heat to feed into the district energy system. So this is all, um, what we call low temperature, so it's under boiling point of water, basically. And um, uh, that's what's used uh, in district energy, and I think that's what we would be um, looking at in um, the forward osmosis process. So if you go to the next slide, please. This shows um, a pit thermal energy storage system. So the pit storage that we provide is essentially like a pyramid turned upside down with the top cut off. So it's a you know it's a it's like a trough um, where um, uh, there, there comes a liner inside to seal it. Of course, at the bottom uh, it gets uh, filled with water to the top. And then there are several layers of a lid that come on top. That is a patented uh, proprietary technology that we have. So the lid insulates the water inside the pit. And we bring these temperature, uh, once it is complete, we bring the temperature in the pit up to about 95 Celsius. So this is a very large um, amount of water and a large amount of heat that can last for a couple of months. And there are several district energy systems in Denmark in particular that um, I utilize this technology. We've also built one in Tibet in a very arid uh, and remote region um, that is also combined with uh, flat panel collectors. So on the next slide, uh, this is just a brief one. There is a little bit slightly different technology. These are evaporated uh, flat panel systems, uh, evacuated, I mean. So there is an, an air vacuum in there that allows for a higher temp uh, for higher efficiency uh, in the collection. And um, you can also see here 4.7 megawatt. That's a pretty good output for a solar plant, and it's quite. And you see what approximately what the size of a system like this is in an area that has not that much uh, sunshine. So in, in, in areas where the um, insulation is higher, like we would be experiencing, uh, for instance, Argentina, then a system like this could also be a little bit smaller. Uh, but it gives you an idea of uh, what we're looking at. So the next slide, please. Here we, this is a system um, also combined with heat pump. Um, air source heat pump, that's the, the one we showed earlier already, but it, uh, you see a picture of the heat pump, which is housed, um, it's located in the in the building that was to the left of these uh, fans here. And um, heat pumps are quite efficient way also to create a lot of energy, uh, boost energy that is available from the air, can also be a water source heat pump. Uh, we also do wastewater heat recovery, where you can use a 
wastewater, any kind of warm water that you have to extract heat and utilize it in your process. So there are multiple options to work with heat pumps. And um, you know, it always depends on what the needs are of the process that need to be met, and we can tailor then all solutions to whatever is required. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, here we look at the uh, integrated energy system, um, which is a power tower system. So it's uh, different from the, the recent the, the examples I just showed. So in this case here, the main um, point of this one was to um, desalinate water for a tomato growing operation. So on the what is to the what you do not see here in the picture and is to the left and a couple hundred meters away is the ocean. So water is taken from the ocean and then desalinated um, by help of uh, thermal energy here to our collector field and um, solar tower. And this water is being used in the greenhouses that you see to the left. So this, these white squares, these are actually glass greenhouses in which tomatoes are being grown. And um, our, the water that is purified by our system is being used to irrigate there. In addition, there's heat that can be uh, used to keep the temperature in the greenhouses steady at a steady temperature, nice and warm the entire time. And there's some electricity production as well. To um, you know, so it's 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 has it's one solar concentrated system that has multiple energy outputs in multiple ways, and it can drive this entire operation. And um, you know, obviously, this is uh, you know more than we would use for the forward osmosis process. But in mining operations, we have discussed uh, with a number of mining companies um, the option of using a tower system like this one to create pressure for the mining operation. So that's good. Uh, you know, depending on what the situation is, we can have uh, multiple options available. Once I just introduced, we can have the flat panel system, we have parabolic trough, we have tower system, we have heat pumps, we have any combination of those, and we can tailor the solution that we develop to whatever the customer's needs are and install uh, these concentrated solar systems in remote areas. We do not need a gas line, power line, we, we are completely uh, independent as far as that goes, and so that's the beauty of um, solar power and it's CO2 free. So I think that was my last slide. <clears throat> I um, just want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to present again. And uh, here's my um, contact information. Turns out there was a little typo uh, down here by my email address. Of course, it ends in .com. Somehow it ended in CSP, so it's kind of a funny one, but um, yeah, so if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, and of course, with uh, my contact information, reach out to me, reach out to Grant, um, and we'll be happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Great. Th well, thank, thank you, Guido. Great. Thank you both very much for this. Um, I actually do have a question here for Grant. So Grant, using this system with the energy saved, what would be the payback for a solar thermal system? Uh, good, good question. Um, and the answer is it depends, <laughs> not to be cryptic. So the, the payback period is typically going to start with when we do the calculations is what are, what is the energy um, uh, cost uh, per, per, per kilowatt or per, per megawatt? Uh, and that's going to dictate uh, the 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 payback period because as we reduce, that's going to be uh, impact what those savings are. So the first thing we take a look at is what is the uh, the energy costs uh, could vary with respect to um, different areas. It could be very high um, uh, energy costs, could be very low energy costs, uh, and that also dictates um, whether um, uh, partly the economics the solar makes uh, sense or not. Majority of the time, um, it, it, it does make sense for, for, for DLE operations. And the unique thing with solar, 
because of the advancements in the technologies is that a lot of us associate is that, well, we have to be by the equator and the sun has to be, you know, very intense and so on. Because as, as Guido has indicated, because of the, the, um, the advancements and the parabolic shape of focusing and concentrating the, the, the sun's energy into in a focal point to produce that, that heat, even a small amount of, of solar radiance can, can produce you know, a significant amount of power. So uh, that's one thing to take a look at is, is um, the payback period is also just how much um, radiance or how much solar energy is, is going to be available for, for, for us to use. But um, again, with the advancements is that even in, I'm going to say in Canada, um, you know, you still get a, a lot of uh, energy production. The other component on, on the, the 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 cost, of course, is just well, how much energy do I need to re, uh, is required, um, and um, the other side to that, when we take a look at costs, in some instances, there may be carbon credits um, within the, the regions or in that state. So if I can reduce the amount of CO2, uh, that I may be eligible for carbon credits. Now that may be, um, as I said, if you let's say. Fifty dollars per 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 metric ton, um, you know, and I'm going to save a couple of thousand metric tons. Well, that adds up a lot, and that can be used um, to uh, to supplement the cost of that capital project. So, the cost is how much does it um, cost? Depends on the energy, uh, depends on uh, if there's carbon credits, uh, and the other component. Uh, if you want to draw the the envelope a little bit larger, that even though we take a look at just energy costs, in some instances, if there is not a transmission line or, or utility um, uh, infrastructure there, and you have to bring that infrastructure in from, from a distance, I'll tell you the costs are astronomical, as well as the time constraints uh, of, of trying to bring in a transmission line. I can tell you in Canada, it's about five, five million to $8 million uh, a kilometer to, to, to bring in a transmission line. If you're getting to more remote regions and so on, it's going to be even more. So the the aspect of um, of building a solar thermal power station in a remote area uh, becomes more attractive when you contrast that against the cost of having to bring utility lines in. So sorry, as I said, uh, the answer is depends. A little cryptic, but there's a lot of variables and um, and factors associated to doing the cost. I'll tell you that from my experience that I have worked on um, when we do solar thermal and incorporate it integrated into our system, the payback period can range depending on, on the, let's say just on the energy cost from a half a year to four years. So I think that's an important thing to understand is as a um, someone who's designing and, and putting the systems in, and I say, okay, well, we're going to use solar thermal to drive our operations. Um, one of the first things I would I would think of is that are you just kind of kicking the can down the road, meaning that you're you're taking the energy from your system and you're burdening someone else with it, um, and that's not the case when you take a look at the payback period. That the energy we save. Um, is going to allow you to 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 recoup your return on investment is going to be there and your re, your um, recovery rate is going to be back and and it, it's from a, as I said an extreme a half year to 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 four years and if you take a look at you know these mines are going to be in operations for 20 years well that's some pretty significant savings uh, that 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 you're going to be getting so sorry for the long winded answer there was a lot of factors associated with that I hope that answers. Um, uh, the person asked that question. Perfect. I also have two more questions. So for you, Guido, I have, um, if I wanted to do this, what would be the starting point and what would you need from me? Well, we would um, start out with a feasibility, feasibility study uh, at first that would flush out uh, what, the, what the appropriate technologies would be that would meet the needs of uh, what the customer is looking for. And of course, we um, like Grant already uh, kind of led into. Uh, we need to see also what the comparable energy sources are. So uh, let's say you need electricity out at the site. How are you going to get it there? Are you going to put a power line in? 
Are you going to be trucking diesel out uh, forever and ever to run generators? How is this going to happen? And um, so we need to have a cost analysis as well to tell us what you know what is really the cheapest option of uh, of bringing the energy to site. So typically, you know, in this in the case that we've been looking at um, here, uh, we would assume that solar is the best option to bring that energy to site, and then we would then um, uh, study the temperature ranges, the pressure ranges that are needed, and find the appropriate technologies that um, th that could be implemented. And um, that would be our initial look at the project. And uh, once that is uh, clarified and agreed upon, then we would go into a pre-engineering process to um, get a little bit closer to the technologies, spend a little bit more time on each option to um, to run some numbers, crunch some numbers, and uh, come up with results. So. Um, you know, we um, start with sort of a broad brush approach and then narrow down and become more and more specific until we eventually have a real uh, design with plans that can be built in the field. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and now I have a question from Mark Philip. So he says, which, con which configuration gives the 5.8 kilowatt hour per cubic metric energy consumption Solar alone, solar and heat pump, solar and storage, solar and heat and pump and storage. And then what is the TRL of the combination of forward osmosis and solar thermal energy? Uh, good, good questions. Let me just pop, pop up. So uh, what gives the 5.8 is that when yeah. we take a look at. We take a look at it. This is just kind of a standard system. Let me qualify this a little bit more. Uh, this is using a, a, a typical, I'm going to say, um, uh, Eluit um, uh, coming off of a DLE process. Uh, and we're going to be concentrating this up. Um, a deliverable here is that this will be concentrating the Eluit up to about two, let's say, 240 to 260,000 ppm. So remember I said an RO is low TDS. This is going to take it up to a very, very high uh, TDS level. So this is projections of 81%, let's say 80% recovery uh, with a concentrate of around 240, 260,000 ppm, which may correlate to a, a lithium concentration factor of, let's say, up to up to 20x. Um, so significance uh, to that. Now, to get to that concentration and to that uh, uh, concentration factor, uh, there's different ways and configurations to do that. Um, this is a... Uh, solar design, as we said, so when we use a uh, solar thermal energy uh, using taking that heat uh, through a ex uh, heat exchanger, which then transfers that heat to our system, you can see we can eliminate uh, about 20.2 uh, kilowatts per cubic meter based off of this 80% recovery. Um, and that allows us on the solar thermal that gets us to to the 8.6 kilowatts. So associated to it, we need to uh, cooling of the gas and we need a ciliary. So that's our controls. That's the, the, the transfer pumps and so on. To get to question 5.8 kilowatts is that we incorporate the solar thermal that gets rid of the, the thermal uh, side of it and the cooling side and the cooling side, as I said, in a lot of these applications DLE where we're pulling the brine up from the ground it can be anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees C that is not uncommon and what we do is then using a heat exchanger again we would then use that brine to reject the heat from our system cooling to to help uh, capture and condense the gases down so when we combine solar and cooling we get to our 5.8 kilowatts this is modeled off of off of 80% recovery of water, concentrating up to 240, uh, 240 to 260,000 ppm at a, a lithium concentration factor up to about 20x. So uh, a couple of um, parameters to there. Whereas on the development side, um, on the, uh, you know, I, I think I can uh, speak to to Alborg. Alborg has been around for. Uh, a, a while you can you can see all the commercialized uh, projects uh, that uh, Guido has just uh, implemented. So where are we on TRL? It, it's commercialized. 
for FO, we, we have had um, uh, plants that are operating in Canada and China, uh, and we also have our facilities in, in, in Canada. So on the TRL level is that uh, this, is, uh, this has been uh, introduced into, into market. The solar uh, FO is simply taking two mature technologies and, and integrating them together. So um, where does this exist right now? Um, this is a product, a new product that or solution offering we're uh, entering into the market with because of the demand, particularly in South America, um, of the, the energy requirements and the lack of utilities. This really answers and, and addresses the client needs. So um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I'm just going to look through again see if we have any more questions that have come mm, in yeah maybe uh, maybe i can add a, just a sentence to what grant just said so obviously uh since we have from our side from our side and uh, we have of course built a, a number of these systems and understand the technology very well so what are for us what we use as input parameter if you if you were to go with um, a driver system as forward as most is here we need the temperature the pressure and the volume of um, whatever the uh, forward osmosis system uh, requires, and this this becomes our design point. So we would we would just lay out the system to deliver exactly that, and um, you know that that's that's our part. So then um, the forward water system would would kick in at that point, but. Um, so and that means then uh, technology uh, readiness level is uh, is at nine or what is the highest one? But I mean we are ready for deployment here, so um, it's it's not really under development anymore. So thank you. Well, I've just looked through, and there doesn't seem to be any more questions at this time. Excellent. Well. Um... I'll extend uh, our thank you to, to everyone that was uh, on the webinar. I really hope that um, this information uh, was, of, uh, was of value or benefit to you. And again, if you have uh, any questions with respect to the solar thermal, please reach out to uh, Guido from Alborg. And any questions for me on the FO operations, um, please reach out to me. Or if you're interested in the solar thermal uh, uh, offering, uh, reach out to me, and I can uh, I can do up some modeling, and I can provide you with some uh, the the capex and opex um, uh, projections on that. Thank you. Oh, um, I just see some yeah. people typing. Do we want to just give wait one more minute in case a question sure. comes in? <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, no, it was just a thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Well, thank you <laughs> okay. again, everyone. Have yourself a great week, and again, thank you for attending. I, I hope the, yes. the information was benefit and we appreciate your time as always. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye.